Welcome to Fan Counters. My name's Nick. And I'm Elizabeth. And you can find us on social media. Search Facebook for Fan Counters. You can also go to Fan Counters. We have a private Facebook group called Sharpie Nation. So one of those two spots, you'll find us, and you can stay in touch with everything we have coming up on the show. Elizabeth, we're still under lockdown, still waiting to hear if we get freedom anytime soon. Uh, And I think things are still going as they were last week. They're tough. Yes. There have been no changes in the household of mine. Oh, man. That's terrible. Well, we only have about a month to go. And that's what I told the kids today. Because can I just tell you, the, the class that I hate the most that my kids have is art. This art class has got to go. And I'm all, <laughs> I'm a fan of the arts. I am, you know, into the acting and filmmaking and all that. I love the arts. But this art class drives my kids crazy because they are such perfectionists. They want to do everything right. We are doing self-portraits. And I think oh. I have a stack of failed self-portraits. I have yelling, I don't want to do this. It's not going well upstairs right now. Yeah, we've just walked away from art. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't know that was an option. You know, it's kind of funny because I listen to some of the, the, I go to every class with my 10 year old and I listen to some of the teachers who are on these, they, as I said before, they do a mini lesson, then you have an actual homework assignment, but then on a certain time during the day, you actually can check in with the teacher. And so I, I, it confuses me that there's 103 in the class, and sometimes the kids that will show up to these Zoom meetings are like 15, sometimes maybe 40. What? And I'm thinking, where are the other 60-some kids? Right? Like, do you not understand that this is the math time, and this is the time they're supposed to show up? And then we get like these assignments. Like right now we're doing this fantasy notebook because we're reading fantasy, a fantasy book. And today in her meeting, she was like, just so you realize it's due next week. Um, you know, this week, by the end of the week, it's due on Friday. And we're on, I'm going to make it up and say we're on slide 13 or something. And it clearly, she was clearly saying to people, some of you haven't started. Oh, man. And I'm like. How is that even possible? We've been on this now for four weeks. This is week four. How could you not? I mean, what are these kids doing? We all have the same Chromebooks because they're provided by our school district. So it's not like you don't have an internet connection because Spectrum gave free internet to everyone in our area if you didn't have it. So I don't understand what these kids are. Now, with gym, music, and art, those are the ones we're a little bit more wishy-washy about. We're counting the children's piano lessons and band lessons as music. Uh-huh. Sure. And we're counting Lillian's dance class and Oliver does Just Dance Every Day as his exercise. We're counting that as gym. So we're not doing either of those. We get the teacher checks in each kind of day and we tell them, you know, each week rather, we tell them what we've done and we're kind of logging what the children are doing as far as music and, and Jim is concerned. But we did art that first week and it was still life. And she had to draw a banana and a, an orange and it went very similar to the self-portrait. So we just walked away from art. <laughs> wow. We're not doing it at all. No, it was just too much stress. It is a lot of nope. stress. It is. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Anyway. Uh, look, one guest we're never going to have on the show is Michael Jordan. I'm sure he'll never join us. So we'll, we can talk about him freely. It's totally fine. He's got a brand new documentary all about him and his life and his whole history on ESPN. And I haven't seen a second of it, but I did find one story a little bit fun to listen to. And that would be the fact that Michael Jordan became a huge celebrity to the point where you were questioning how he would get things done like going grocery shopping. And that's always a question I have for a megastar is how do you go grocery shopping and deal with all the fans? Well, in this documentary, uh, we figured that out. He would end up calling Jewel Osco, which is a grocery store chain in Illinois, about 15 minutes before they were closed and tell him he was coming in so they would stay open late to let him shop. And then, of course, he would give him a big tip on his way out. He also received police escorts to and from his destination so he would get there on time because he was so 
you know, inundated with fans. So I, I found that to be. Why don't you just hire an assistant? Yeah, I don't really see the need for Michael Jordan to have to actually go to the grocery store himself, but okay. Yeah, I, I would have sent someone, although as you, as I have recently told you on the show, sending my assistant to the grocery store hasn't gone so well. <laughs> 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 I went the wrong so. But I think if you were actually Michael Jordan's assistant, you'd you would get, it get right. to know what he wanted and you'd bring home the right stuff. <laughs> Unless your husband was his assistant. Right, yeah, that's never going to happen. No, as a matter of fact, I broke down and went to the store myself because I was just tired of it. And then just by happenstance on Saturday, he went to work and he was going to pass a Sam's Club. And so rather than me going, I said, could you stop on your way home and grab these literally eight items on the list? He called me three times. (laughs) I was like, oh my gosh, these are like like bulk items, right? Like, so not only do we normally buy them, but they hang around for a while because there's a lot of it. So I'm a little bit confused why you don't know what they look like. (laughs) (laughs) But yep, nonetheless. The other celebrity I wanted to talk about is Miley Cyrus. Now, we've been hearing all in the media about all these celebrities encouraging us to do the right thing and stay home and stay safe and all this stuff, right? So one of the memes I found over this past weekend, and I, I posted it, is the next time you hear a celebrity saying, we'll get through this together, send them your electric bill with a thank you note. (laughs) So that rang true. I saw that. And (laughs) don't you feel like that, though? Kind of. I mean, well, and and it is. I get it. Well, here is Miley Cyrus. She has come out and said that celebrities aren't truly experiencing the coronavirus crisis. She quotes, I have no idea what this pandemic is like. Let me read the rest of this. It says, my life has been pushed to pause on, but really, I have no idea what this pandemic is like. I'm comfortable in my space. I'm able to put food on my table. I'm financially stable. And that's just not the story for a lot of people, she said. I'm very, very cautious of ever claiming that I know best because the one thing I know is that I don't. And that is probably the best celebrity quote I have ever seen regarding this pandemic come out. Yeah, I agree that she's just like, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut because I'm, I'm clueless on this. I, I think tr- that's a good idea. But anyway, all right, let's move on to the show this week. I'm pretty excited about this one. You and I had a chance to read the book. We did. 500 pages plus. Yes. I haven't read a book since high school, but I read <laughs> this book. And I had to read the book um, via PDF. Correct, me too. Which is my least favorite way to read a book. Mm-hmm. I do not care for a Kindle or an Audible or whatever it is. I want to feel it, touch it, hold it in my hand. So it was very difficult for me to get through this book, although it is a very good book. And really, I enjoyed it. That is the hardest thing for me to do is to read these books online. And it had my name slapped on every page so that if on we copied page, it. That's right. So we couldn't, uh, so we couldn't go out and... and pre-leak this before it comes out. Right, right. Well, we're going to leak a bunch of it today. We're talking about the book from Mark Freeman. It's called Modern Family, the untold oral history of one of television's groundbreaking sitcoms. And it's the only major book that's ever been written that explores this show as told by those who created it. More than 70 people, including the cast and crew and creators, will detail the full history of this iconic sitcom. The cast recalls their memories of the trials and tribulations of casting. They share their impressions from the first table read to the last light turning out. Writers, directors, and performers walk readers through storylines, production, and favorite episodes. And on the show today, we have the author, the guy who spent time on set, and the guy who wrote the book. Mark Freeman is here. Coming to you from nowhere near the entertainment capital of the world, this is Fan Counters. With Nick and Elizabeth on the Podfix Network. There was this mob of people, and they're screaming my name. Crazy fans. Stop following me. Don't come around my house. If you do, the cops are going to be at yours. If I'm having dinner with my wife, don't sit down at my table. Don't follow me into the bathroom. Can I take a picture? Oh, my God. I think this guy wants to fight me. Ended up being a fan. I'm the only one that's ever been on Sam Jackson and lived to tell about it. (laughs) Well, guess what? I have a big surprise for you. That's why we call it Fan Counters. (laughs) I don't think you're going to last on the air very long. Mark Freeman, you're the author of a book, The Untold Oral History of One of Television's Groundbreaking Sitcoms, Modern Family. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you for having me. 
So I'm going to start by asking a question that I wondered when I read through this book. Did you one morning just wake up and thought, I love this show. I want to chronicle the entire adventure. Is that what happened? How did you gain access to the set and the cast and crew in order to write this book about modern family? Well, it's, uh, that's a good question. There, there, there's kind of like a step-by-step process that took me to that point, which is that a few years prior, I had wrote an article, an oral history of the Smothers Brothers comedy show, um, which was very famous for being politically incorrect and just dealing with politics at all in the late 60s when television was a lot more conservative. And I had so much fun doing that and got to talk to so many cool people on that. I kind of took it to starting to think, well, what are some of my favorite shows? And so I did oral histories of MASH and Cheers and Taxi and the Bob Newhart show. Uh, I wrote about uh, Seinfeld. I interviewed Norman Lear for All in the Family. So, and I was doing all these shows that as a kid I was geeking out on. Yeah. And I could even geek out on them today. <laughs> but uh, mm-hmm. uh, eventually I did a piece for Frasier, on Frasier for Vanity Fair. And with that piece, I met some of the people from Modern Family, specifically Chris Lloyd, who was the showrunner, one of two showrunners for Frasier, helped create. He's the co-creator of Modern Family. Mm-hmm. Um, and the second one is the casting director, um, Jeff Greenberg. He worked on Cheers, and he worked on Frasier, and then he carried over to working on uh, Modern Family. So. That brings us to the point of the Meyer family. <laughs> it wasn't really a waking up in the morning, but what it was, was I realized it's a show I like. It's a show I know, and I only want to write about shows I know. I don't want to have to research them because then my heart isn't in it. Right. And I thought, you know, this show is ending either this year, meaning the 10th year. They weren't sure if they were going to an 11th or the following year. And our histories in general aren't about current shows. Um, An SNL one done by Tom Shales, because SNL never ends, uh, (laughs) did try to bring it up, but most of them reflect act. So I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if you could do an oral history that captured the history and the present and maybe even gave you kind of preparation for the future? And so I reached out to Chris Lloyd, and I said, is this something you'd be into? And he really liked the Frasier article, which was really important to me because I admire Chris so much. And he said, um, yeah, I think that's something that you'd probably get a lot of interest in here. Hmm. And so from there, he, the next step was getting Steve Levitan, the other co-creator, to buy in. I didn't know him at all. And I thought to myself, if I don't get Steve, I'm not going to do it because you can't really just have one voice like that. But uh, Steve was, was on board, too, and so from there they, they helped wrangle the uh, cast, uh, writers, crew. And I talked to more, more than 100 people, which was never my intention. I, I never had a number in my mind, but uh, I always follow a lead. So a new name comes up, I'm thinking, i got to call that person. So would you have categorized yourself like as a super fan before you did this and then became more of a fan? How did this change how you felt about the the program? So, you know, I had two impressions of the show. I, I was a huge fan at the beginning. I had heard all about it because there was so much chatter about it prior to the pilot, which is rare in television because people usually just, you get a couple of reviews, but you're waiting. But this had months ahead. People were just chomping at the bit for this. So me and my wife were fans early on. And in, in later years, I started to drift a little, which many people admit they did, <laughs> um, just because it's hard to follow a show for 11 years. Um, and then my daughter started watching it. So then she was looking at it uh, through newbie eyes and a kid's perspective on these families. And so then it became kind of a family thing. So when I went on to, went on to set and when I was talking to people, you never know what you're going to get. It can be a mixed bag when you're talking. Um, I, I'd have to say 99% of the time of the people I've spoken to on anything, they've been really, really cool. Um, but what ended up here that I kind of was discovering was that this family on the show was really a family in real life, which is 
in some ways a normal phenomenon for long-running shows because you spend more time with the people on the set than you end up with your family. Right. Right. But there can still be like friction uh, and uh, a lot of smut on set. <laughs> um, and uh, this show, you know, it had some smut, but I wasn't going to write about it. It wasn't that big a deal to me because that's not what to me, if you're leaving a legacy of a show in print, you really want to look at how that show was made. So when I was there, I just started to fall in love with the show all over again. And then I just started to fall in love with everybody there. And, and I couldn't get enough of it. I, I was down there a total of twice. Um, and each time I was just thinking, gosh, I wish I could have stayed another week and done nothing but watch everybody. But still. So you got all these interviews done in two weeks? Actually, I started um, in April of last year. I think I did my first interview. And most of the interviews were done on the phone. Okay. Um, and that would run into September, October. And then I went down on set um, and, and finished, followed up with interviews. Um, some people I hadn't gotten yet from cast and crew. Um, and then I went back and followed up on interviews as I got to know these people. And, and, and I think a fundamental thing, if you're going to do an oral history is to get people to let their guard down. And so I followed these people, talked to them numerous times, and in doing so was getting them to let their, their guard down. And so you just do, I have hundreds of hours of transcripts is what I ended up with in interviews. Um, just from talking to the people and getting to know them and getting to know their lives and getting to know what they think of the show and the craft and the industry and television and so on. Um, you come in for the interviews in truth and people warn you about people. They're, they're all, you know, well, beware of this guy or, or, or this woman's going to be tough on you. And, and uh, Ed, Ed's a great example. He was one of the first people I, I spoke to, Ed O'Neill. Um, he picked up the phone uh, when I called and he gave me this really gruff hello. And I, and it just kind of like froze me. <laughs> mm. I thought I'm dead. Uh, <laughs> and then I said, Oh, you know, Ed, uh, this is Mark. Uh, we had arranged this interview. And then he was like, Oh, hi. And then he was like the friendliest guy. I loved Ed to death. Ed, Ed can tell a story better than anybody. Um, he can take a drink of Coke and turn it into a five minute episode, but you enjoy the whole thing. You're wrapped around it. <laughs> so, you know, there was a, different things. Like people said, Ty Burrell is going to be the nicest person on earth. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, you hear that from time to time. And then Ty Burrell ended up being like the nicest person on earth. And he remembers, he remembers things. He was remembering the name of my kid. I'd come back a couple months later or text him and he remembered things in conversations that with his world and all the requests he gets for contact and interviews, he has no business necessarily remembering. Um, it kind of reminded me of, uh, I was told years ago that Bill Clinton, if he met Clinton, he remembered and retained everything. Hmm. Uh, even if you met him once in like 1991, <laughs> passing him by on aisle four of a food store, he'd be like, oh yeah, hey. So, you know, certain people can do that and they, they can uh, retain that. And so, you know, what ultimately you end up doing is uh, you just follow who they are. And if they're gruff, you're going to win them over. If they're sweet, you're going to squeeze the sweetness. Uh, and if they're in a good or bad mood that day, you're just going to kind of flow with it, you know? How do you decide what questions you wanted to ask? The way these oral histories work for me anyway is the first couple people set the table. And in this instance, Chris Lloyd, I believe, was might have been the first one I spoke to. And we, and we had that first conversation was like three hours. And I prepared a list of what I thought were important questions. How did the show develop? How did you get the cast? Um, the relationships, favorite episodes, favorite moments, typical kind of things and, you know, behind the scenes stuff. So when you talk to the second person, you can take the same questions because I always like to make it like a conversation. So you take the same questions and you follow them. Um, and in doing so, you get responses to what the previous person said because you can say, hey, Chris said blah, blah, blah. And they'll laugh and go, oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And it triggers something with them. 
And in triggering it, then you're following the conversation, and now you're going to ask new questions. Um, so you're either start with a set list, I then go to discover questions based on answers I got, and then within the conversation, I'm following the conversation to see what they want to talk about. Um, because if you stunt it, if somebody's telling you something and you and you say, yeah, but anyway, when you were four, it kind of... You don't mm -hmm. talk that way in real life, so why would you talk that way when you're interviewing somebody? So when you were on set, were you feeling like everybody was kind of creeped out, like you might tell the embarrassing things that happened? Like you said, you did witness things you left out of the book. Were you were they afraid that those things might be in the book and therefore not open to allowing you to see different things? Initially, everybody has their guard up. Um, and when they start hearing that somebody else says this, I mean, you could, and I didn't, you could really manipulate this if you want, <laughs> because you could say somebody said this and that, and uh, which they didn't, and then get them to say something a little deeper and so on. But I'm always fully transparent. I'm an open book. And if I'm talking to you, to them, to the cash register person, you know, the cashier at a, at a whatever, at a Target, um, I will reveal stuff about myself, which will bring comfort to them to break down the walls. And so if you speak to them multiple times, such as I did, and then I'm hanging out with them on set, I just kind of become a fly on the wall or in certain instances, somebody to bounce ideas off of or just to, to chit chat with. Um, and so at that point, you know, the guards can start to come can come down a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. It's funny that sometimes you notice the first time I'd meet people, that's the guard would come back up because now they're seeing me in person. Um, but then instantly, because they're on set and they're surrounded by all the comfortable people and they notice that I'm not doing anything, uh, they're comfortable. And then occasionally something happens on set or somebody says something and they come over to me afterwards and they say, that's not going to be in the book, is it? You know, because a set is a safe zone. They had to trust me that I wouldn't do put things in they didn't want to put in, but that we could talk about everything. And really, that's where you get the best stuff is if people let their guard down, talk about everything, um, and just let you go. Um, I think one other thing which I find very useful is... Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, it's apparently a lot of journalists don't do this, which to me would be journalism 101, but you research your subject. Right. So if I'm talking to Eric Stone Street, you know, I research the heck out of him, and I look for some connection, something in his life that kind of transfer, integrates with my life, some experience, someone we mutually know, and or something somebody else said, like I was saying, off the record, somebody said this. And then you kind of let them you know, you let them in that way and they let you in and they kind of feel it. I've been told several times on different projects by people, they go, wow, you really researched this. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, why wouldn't I? Because otherwise there's a great chance I'm going to look like an idiot. And, and uh, so I always want something to fall back on if I need it. It's mm -hmm. what I start with. It's what I can fall back on in the middle of a conversation and what I can do however I can, um, to earn your trust. And like, um, I was on set, uh, I think it was my first day on set. Um, and Stephen Merchant was there. Uh, he was filming, uh, an episode called the Prescott, which I believe was episode 14 out of the 18 this year. And he was sitting next to uh, Ed across from me and we were chit chatting about something. And I asked him, I go, you know, uh, Extras, and that was the series he had done with Ricky Gervais. And I said, uh, "There's that song that you that David Bowie sings to Ricky Gervais's character. It was called Little Fat Man." And and I said, "Where did that come from?" Because I was so interested in the fact that David Bowie had kind of done this song. And uh, he really appreciated the fact that I remembered that. And so he, he tells me this whole story, and he says, "You know, he wrote the lyrics to the song, and Bowie wrote the melody." but that when he was doing it, uh, Bowie was asking for direction and Merchant told him, just do another Heroes, which <laughs> I thought was kind of funny. In the beginning of the book, you talked about the schedule of Modern Family cast had that they were almost always leaving by lunch. This is quite a rarity in the business. 
Can you tell us, I, I kind of got the impression it was because they were only doing one family at a time, but how do you think they managed to pull that off? So very early on, um, Steve Levitan had done a pilot. Uh, this predates Modern Family by several years. It was called Foot Hooker, and it was about this band that was really big, American band, big in Europe, that can't get noticed back in America. Um, and it was funny because I went up to Steve at one point and I said, is this kind of like a David Hasselhoff thing? Because David Hasselhoff is huge in Germany, but you know, no one takes him seriously as a singer over here. They just think of, you know, the yeah, actor. Yeah, I'm going Baywatch, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> they, they got their Baywatch filter glasses on, so there's no way. But he had, he had meant to, when he presented it, he wanted to do a little, film a little of it, what it would be like. And they gave him like $30,000 and he went off and he filmed it. Um, the producer uh, on Modern Family, Jeff Morton, he worked with Jeff on it. And they ended up, rather than shooting a couple minutes, they shot the entire thing for this 30000 So they did a pilot for pennies in the industry. And one of the things that came out of that, and this is something that Jeff Morton said he was always trying to do, was in the equation of filmmaking, Typically, you have 45 minutes to set up within the hour and 15 minutes of filming. And wouldn't it be cool if you could flip that and do 45 minutes of filming and 15 of setup? And how do you get there? And it's not even the question of why isn't everybody do, doing this, but it's more like, how do you get there? And, and one of the things they came up with was um, what they call universal lighting. So... It's, it's lighting that allows you to shoot from any angle. You don't have to reset lighting. And that takes a lot of time to reset lighting because you're not only moving the equipment, then you got to bring the stand-ins or the actors back to make sure everything's good. So there's rehearsals involved with that, and that's where a lot of that 45 minutes comes up. And so what they came up with was A, universal lighting, and then B, this mockumentary style done in such a way that if you picture uh, looking down on a square room and you put camera A in the bottom left at a 45 degree angle and you put camera B bottom right in a 45 degree angle, it's closer than this, but I'm giving you the generalities, that you could capture all the action with those two cameras without the cameras ever seeing each other mm -hmm. and getting into their space. And so it would almost be like a play because you could capture everything. Um, Adam Devine, uh, who played Andy on the show, he, he told a story about asking at one point, where's my close-up shot? When are we doing that? Um, and they said, you're not. Uh, we already captured it because with the cameras where they are, they can bring them in, you know, bring the focus in and do all the camera work, the medium shots, the long shots, the close-ups. Also, because it's a mockumentary style, uh, it forgives mistakes. Um, the camera operators were called more or less another character in the series. Uh, the key was they could never be ahead of the action. If somebody says something, you pan the camera over quickly to them to catch it, and you can be sloppy in the pan. And so the perfectionism of the camera operator was forgiven, and in some ways even discouraged at times. And that universal lighting just made it so you didn't have to reset. And then, like you said, the fact that you have three families, and in a lot of episodes, there's three different A plot lines. So something happening different in each household that never crosses over necessarily. So that would mean maybe a Monday, Tuesday, it's, it's Ed and Sophia, and then Wednesday is Cam and Mitch, and then Thursday, Friday is the, the Dunphy family. And so, yeah, they would get there about seven in the morning, sometimes six in the morning um, for makeup. And oftentimes they would be done around lunchtime, which would be one or two. Um, so that worked out very well for them. And then other, and other shows started asking them about that because they, uh, <laughs> they wanted to pick it up as well. Yeah, those are some pretty sweet hours, man. Yeah, especially in this well, business. He, uh, well, you know, one other thing, too, because you just really think of this, which is kind of funny. They, all the time that I was on set, 
those those episodes ran late. They started at seven and they finished around eight or nine at night. And the crew members, who were just the greatest group of people, and I've stayed friends with several of them, um, they'd always walk by if they saw me and, and say hi and so on. And then they'd say, well, you, you sure chose the wrong week to stop by here. And you know, I'm a kid in a candy store. They could have gone to midnight. I was having the time of my life. Um, but to them, this was such so foreign to their world that uh, they couldn't help but do that. And so I was there for all the episodes I was there. Every episode, they would apologize and say, oh, it's normally not like this. <laughs> um, but like I said, I was fine with it. So, Mark, I love reading about the little tidbits about the behind-the-scenes stuff, finding things out like Julie Bowen, finding out about the show being picked up as she's giving birth. That's kind of crazy. What are some of your favorite little tidbits that you found out and included in this book? Ed O'Neill's book of acting to me is this silly, inane thing. That one jumps to mind always first because, and this is a perfect example of what you said before about knowing what questions to ask. I think Eric Stone Street was the first one to mention it. And he said, you know, Ed does, does these things and then he tells us about them. And, Pi and Eric kind of came up with the idea of we should write these down and maybe even make a book of it for the internally, a joke book in a sense. Mm -hmm. And so in interviewing people, I learned in Ed O'Neill's book of acting, which is about 15 rules, and, and Ed would talk about them. And again, Ed being the storyteller would just wax poetic on them. Um, he loved to talk about the, the food bit which is that whenever a scene, he never eats food. Whenever a scene starts and he's at a place and he's eating, he's pulling the fork out of his mouth and making the chewing motion. Um, and so he he's said, people don't do this, but this is like the most basic thing. You never have to eat that way. Um, and, uh, you know, he talked about if you're taking something out of your pocket, you're, you've already palmed it in your hand inside your pocket so that you don't have to fumble around to get it out. Um, there, there was one I told him too that that uh, they said was like um, holding the baby, and I asked him about that, and he, and the first time he didn't remember, but the second time I was sitting him with him in the trailer, and he's like, you know, I was thinking about that baby thing, and I remembered it, and he said, if you hold the baby, you get to go home with the baby, and uh, he goes, that's not always true, but you try, and and the point being, babies can only be on set for short amounts of time. So if you're seen and you can manage to hold the baby uh, and the baby's only there, they're allowed to be there in these 20 minute intervals in the day. Um, and you get to go home even earlier, which was kind of a funny thing. Hmm. Um, watching just the way people interact, you know, there was one thing you just said before, which made me think, because you said that's in the book. There was a chapter I ended up pulling out of the book just because I didn't have room at that point, which was about practical jokes and I loved the tidbits on those because there were, there were some jokes that ran almost the length of the show. Um, Eric had one and Chris had one and they were the biggest pranksters between them. And they both told me that they were going to pay off the joke uh, at the rap party with neither the other, not knowing that they were going to pay off their particular joke. So in Chris's instance, there was this um, hot pie container from a dinner and there was a car scene and he had placed that half empty container. I believe it was because Eric had left it out somewhere. He placed it on Eric's seat in the car and Eric saw it and removed it. And then it kept showing up. <laughs> and what I then came to learn was Chris told me in secret that he he had that pot pie container in his freezer and had been holding on to it for about seven years and was going to give it to Eric at the party. And then meanwhile, Eric had this whole joke with sneakers. This Chris likes to play basketball and Eric had made this horrible pair of uh, Nike sneakers, horrible colors, horrible looking. And he had an assistant bring it to Chris on set in front of people and say, here are your new, here's your new sneakers you ordered. And Chris was like, I didn't order these. And was like, no, no, these are yours. And so it was this big joke. And again, disappeared. And Eric said, I'm just going to, I'm going to, he doesn't know that I'm going to give him a present at the end. He's going to open the present and the sneakers are going to be inside. And it was so indicative of uh, the playfulness 
um, that you would see on set. Um, one thing that I, meant, that I do mention in the book is uh, with Lily, the Lily babies before they ended up with Aubrey, um, they didn't want to be there. They cried constantly and uh, the creators didn't want to put kids in pain from a practical standpoint. It would slow down production from a heart standpoint. Nobody wants to hear a child cry right. and from a uh, kind of mental standpoint. You don't want to ruin these kids lives down the road. And so one thing that Jesse would do that he told me was he would sing this song from guys and dolls. He'd have the baby. Uh, they were twins. And so they would swap them in and out. Um, but he, he'd hold the baby. He'd sing this song from Guys and Dolls, and for some reason that one particular song would calm the baby for a while, and so they would try to do a scene quickly uh, <laughs> after he had like put them into a trance with the song. So I was on set, um, and the babies that were playing Haley's twins, um, he picked it up, and sure enough, he broke into he broke into the Guys and Dolls song again, which was kind of funny uh, to see. Um, and there was a, these are random things, you know, that pop flash into your head, but there was a moment uh, at the very end when um, the kid who plays Joe, he was, well, he was talking with, um, uh, he was talking with Ed and Ed, like out of the blue said, you know, you know, when, when this whole thing is done, um, you can have my, my wedding ring with, and at first I'm like, why would he give him his wedding ring? And then I realized it's the wedding band, which was just a piece of steel that he had on his finger that he wore for the show. And the kid was so excited. I mean, to watch him, he was like, he would have thought he had just won the lottery. He was so thrilled. And, and things like that to me, um, which you could pick up if you sat with a family at dinner. And I'm not saying that just because this is our family and a family, you could see it on a baseball team. You could see it anywhere, sure. but capturing, observing, listening, capturing things. Uh, I just, I love those. One of the things I thought was interesting was that just kind of the evolution of how the show went, that they originally had thought possibly a documentary from the point of view of the foreign exchange student. And then to like pixelate people who hadn't signed the release, I, I thought that was kind of, of of nice of you to include kind of like the evolutionary thought process of how they actually got to the mockumentary. What what other kinds of gems do you think um, that people will find kind of like aha moments when they read the book? I'm really into the art of creation. And whenever I do these pieces, I love talking to the writers to see the origin of stories or of ideas. Um, the pixelation you mentioned, that was uh, Danny Zucker. Um, he, he thought it would just be really funny. Uh, uh, so it was, it was an idea he threw out that never came to fruition, but he just thought it would be funny throughout the entire series to have this pixelated um, brother. Um, uh, and uh, I, it was like a brother, I believe, of... Jay or Phil, I don't remember which, but he he just thought that would be the funniest thing. Um, so people early on, and one of the things, if you're into either the show or television production, you can see the evolution of ideas into concepts, into character, into storylines. And in this case, the mockumentary um, style, a lot of people, it was very popular at the time, and it's still used now, but at the time you had Parks and Rec, which had just started, you had The Office, and you had this, which was the only one doing it in a family atmosphere. And they were trying to figure out, which you can read about in the book, like, what do you do with this mockumentary style? How do you present it? And, and for the writers, it was confusing the first year because they always thought in the mindset of, could a documentary crew fit here to film something? So the writers would run over from their offices to the set and they'd look around and they'd say, oh, no, you know, oh, you, you couldn't fit here. And so they would go back and try to think of something else. And even on the set itself, they built certain things so that they could conceivably stick a camera. Um, but it, the problem was, was it was getting in the way of the actual show and the stories. And so Steve Levitan, the co-creator, said at the, somewhere at the beginning of season two, 
it's not a mockumentary. It's just a shooting style. It's just a thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, The Office, I believe in its last year, revealed there was an actual documentary crew. There was just this moment where someone trips over, I believe it was a cord or there's a boom mic or something like that. Um, And this show was never going to do it. And one of the things that's interesting when you follow the creation of the show, all the all the characters and the ideas was they had a very valid point, which was that if it's a real documentary, then you're bringing a camera into family homes. And what kind of people would do that? You know, would you do that with your family? Stick cameras in front of their kids to grow up? That would be something where you wouldn't like these people as much and they wanted to like these people. So if you if you read the book, some of the things I like in particular are, you know, how people were cast following that. But I also really like how ideas for plots and storylines came um, in particular episodes, such as um, the Las Vegas episode, which I had never intended to necessarily write about. I just thought, I'm going to see what, what episodes people me- mention. And early on, that was a, an episode universally mentioned, so I realized I'm going to do a chapter on that and talk about the origins of it and everything about it. And there's another chapter, which is just pure writers saying this episode came from here, and from my life, because most of those early stories were all from their lives. Um, Chris Lloyd told the story about this old Lincoln car he had, uh, that just was on, living on fumes and it smelled and it had all these things stuck to the floor and the side you know, because he had kids. And that's, that's what happens to station wagons yeah. um, and to minivans. And he told the story of trying to sell it more or less for parts and that somebody finally just saved them and took it out of the, out of the driveway and drove off with it. And that watching it drive off, he got a little verklempt. I was a little sad because he kind of saw the memories of what had happened in that car, driving off with the car. Um, you know, everything of watching the kids grow up, taking them to parties, having moments together. And it was really touching when he told it. And so I really wanted to see, and you'll learn in the book, the origins of a lot of stories and how they came from writers' lives and were either projected almost the, the exact same story on screen or, or were embellished uh, for comedic effect. Well, Elizabeth and I are great test subjects for this book because I am an avid uh, super fan of Modern Family and she's never seen an episode. So she read the book. We talked about it this morning before we called you and she loved it just as much as I did. You were very thorough about the way the book goes through each character and the family and kind of explains the casting process. Um, Some things that I learned that people will as well when they read it is that Rico Rodriguez almost got replaced because he was hard to understand. We learned that Craig T. Nelson was almost cast as the patriarch of the family and not Ed O'Neill. So I want to talk just real quickly about Ed O'Neill because he is sort of the star of the show and he really does steal it based on his Married with Children days. So he would actually tap his watch when he was filming kind of as a, come on, let's go. I'd rather be home grilling meat. Uh, did you see this kind of thing firsthand where he was kind of just keeping everybody on, on track? Well, what was interesting um, for, I think, yeah, pretty much all the episodes I saw, they were integrated episodes. So they, they, it wasn't that three storyline thing. Like one of them, The Last Christmas, was all the characters more or less gathered at a Christmas table at Mitch and Cam's. Right. And so there was more of a need for him to be on set than normal. Um, I'm talking days and actual setup. But a, a good example with Ed is I was in his room um, and I, I came in. He was nice enough to bring me into his trailer, and I figured I'll chit chat with Ed for 10 minutes. I have a question or two to follow up on. And we talked for more than an hour. And in that, at some point, Leslie Merlin, um, who is just kind of the soul of the show in the background, she knocked on the door and said to Ed, Hey, everyone's gathering on set. Do you, do you want to come? Uh, for the rehearsal, and, and he said, "No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm talking, I'm talking to Mark." <laughs> and he just said, "No," and and it wasn't like a thing where she had to, you know, coax him to go. It was more like, "Okay, we're going to get the stand-in like we normally do," and 
and went on. And it wasn't going to hurt production at all. <laughs> um, but it was just the type of thing where Ed, Ed doesn't like to mess around. And, and I don't mean that in the sense of he's a tough guy kind of thing. Uh, he just wants to he wants to be shooting. One of the rules in his book is uh, shooting the rehearsal. Why can't we just shoot the rehearsal? <laughs> um, he likes he just likes to be in character. He, he's one of the biggest fans of the show. People would tell stories of what he would do um, when not on set. Just a huge fan of the show, knows it's the best opportunity perhaps he ever had in his career. But at the same time, yeah, he wants to grill his meat. You're right about that. Or, or uh, re- read some kind of book or whatever. Um, there's a million things Ed, Ed does, which is funny and, and is told in the book. He has a lot of hobbies, and they're very different from one another. So it's, it's a dynamic personality. Um, so, you know, uh, at the end of the day, he's there. He'll give you his effort. But he, when you're done, if he doesn't have to hang around, right. he doesn't want to have to hang around. Um there was there was something on the last episodes. Uh, oh, I know what it was. It was a special shoot for Jimmy Kimmel, um, where the documentary crew was revealed to be Jimmy Kimmel and his crew. It was a bit for the Jimmy Kimmel show, and it was something they had to shoot after the day's episodes. And so Ed stayed behind for it, um, but really just wanted to shoot his parts, and he was out of there when it was done because it was a favor, obviously, to... Jimmy Kimmel, but people were laughing about it because they thought it fit within Ed's uh, rule book. Just like uh, in in Vegas, um, same thing. Um, mm-hmm. For the Las Vegas episode, there's a whole long story in the book about getting Stephen Merchant on the show. But but one of the things they were really scared about was Ed had one scene left to shoot in Vegas, and he was going to more or less have to stay an extra day while they got Stephen Merchant to come over and they thought there's no way Ed'll go for this. Ed won't do this at all. And, and all Ed did was he went to Ty Burrell and, and he said, is, is he worth it? He being Stephen Merchant and Ty said, Oh yeah, he's worth it. And Ed said, fine, I'm good. Hmm. And so, you know, it was a big to do over, over nothing. Mark, you mentioned that you overheard Ed sometimes talking about married with children do you remember any specific stories that might have come to mind that would be interesting? Two come to mind, actually. Um, one was how the show got canceled. Um, he had, Ed had told me that it was canceled in the off season, and it was after the 11th year, and he thought there was a good possibility they were going to have another year, and he had gone back to the original creators who had a falling out and hadn't been on the show, and they were going to write the last season together, so... In a sense, it would have been Modern Family-ish of planning for the last season and carrying it through. Mm -hmm. But then the network just canceled them in the hiatus without even a word, literally no word, he said. And he he called one of the executives at the network, and he didn't hear from them for six months after it was canceled. And he, he said, you know, I haven't heard from anybody. And the executives said, Ed, Ed, that's so unfortunate. We, we, we dropped the ball. I thought so-and-so was going to call you. They should have done this. They should have done that. And he said, it's, it's done. It's okay. The show's over. But he had heard when the Golden Girls ended, they had uh, all gotten Mercedes Benz to drive home after the last show. And, and so he just said, hey, the cast didn't get anything, nothing. And the executive said, Ed, do you think we'd let you guys go without wonderful gifts? And Ed said, well, you know, it's been six months. And <laughs> right. The executives said, yeah, you know, we have some something wonderful planned. Um, and Ed said, as a helpful hint, I have steak knives. And the guy laughed and he said, you never heard from him again. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, man. That's a terrible way to end. I mean, spending all those years putting on a show and then they don't even tell you uh, it's done. Well, yeah. I watched that one sporadically, and I guess I didn't really realize it just stopped. Same thing, like I, I don't really remember that there wasn't a grand finale. Well, you know, there's a, just to add a little more oomph to it, there's a, there is a story in the book, which I do mention, which is um, Ed finds out the show's canceled, not from the network. He's in Youngstown, Ohio, which is his hometown. He goes back there a lot. And he 
is getting out of a car and a just married couple is there and they see Ed. Um, it's there some hotel he's going to stay at and they, they say, Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. And it's like about what? And they say they heard it on the radio that the show was canceled <laughs> and Ed had no idea. Um, but being Ed, he, he says, you know, I heard it from them, the fans, and I'd much rather hear it from them than hear it from the network or the executives. And, and he bought them a drink. He took them to a bar, bought them a drink for their wedding to celebrate, and uh, then went on his way. And wow. uh, that summarizes Ed in so many ways. Um, you know, the other story, uh, quickly, because it's, it's a longer story, but um, with a, another actor on the show, Amanda Bierce. It might be Barris, actually, and I apologize to her ahead of time if I mispronounced that. Um, but their relationship started to to fall apart. Um, he assigns it to a cover of TV Guide early on, where the TV Guide co- people, the photographers, only wanted the Bundy family. And she thought that it should be everybody. And Ed's attitude was, you know... I'm not in a position to, to demand anything, and what's good for it's good for the show at the end of the day, even if it's just the Bundys. It's advertising for the show, and, and that's good. And she kind of wanted to boycott TV Guide um, for it, so she he said he wasn't very happy with it, and that things kind of deteriorated from there, and got to the point where um, he wasn't invited to her wedding. Uh, and even though she had invited most everybody else, wow. um, and so it, it just became uncomfortable. She directed an episode and, and, and Ed had a, an idea and he said, this is the way it always worked in our modern family too. If you have an idea, you share it. Um, but this idea didn't go well. And so, you know, that contributed it to it all. So they kind of had it out at the end. And what's nice about Ed, one of the best things maybe about Ed is at his age, he's over 70, he's very reflective. And he'll look back and he'll say, maybe I shouldn't have done this or that or the other thing. And there's a couple of things he said to her that he wishes he could take back. And he knows that they were never going to like each other, but there's certain things, if he could, he'd probably apologize for having said, because he's like, there was no need to say things like that. And I like that about Ed, that he can look back and pinpoint things that in retrospect, he might not have... He might not be proud of or wishes he could change, but he didn't. But he took the time to think about them hmm. and come to that conclusion. And I really respect that. One of the writers had wanted to end the series after Haley delivered the twins. And it's quoted from from the writer Walls. If it was up to me, we'd end with Ed O'Neill waking up in the bed with Katie Chagall saying he'd eaten some bad Japanese food the night before and had the strangest dream. But I'm not in charge of the show is what he said. That seems very much like Bob Newhart and Newhart waking up. Um, what other strange ideas did you hear coming up with how to end the show? So uh, you're, you're absolutely right, by the way. That was the Newhart show. And he was saying it um, uh, as, as a joke and in part as an ode to um, Dan O'Shannon, who was a writer for the first five years of the series. He actually came up with the Newhart idea. Um, and he was also a, a big writer on Cheers. Um, but one of the cool things, and this goes back to watching a show that's still alive, is I started talking to the writers before the cast, and I started talking to them from the moment that they got back together just to spit all ideas and outline the final season, what were we going to do, how are we going to do it. And so I would check in with them every couple weeks, and I'd say, hey, what's going on? And uh, I'd hear these different ideas, which I thought was really cool. And to see uh, in, in the big picture, and then I'll give you some specific examples, but in the big picture, they were writing the last episode up until the end end. Um, the second to last episode was shooting till about 6 p.m. on a Friday. And some of the writers came by because they just gotten out of the writer's room and I said, are you there? And they said, well, you know, we're, we're just about there. And then, uh, they went back to work Monday, which I believe was president's day and, and they, they wrapped it up, but I kept checking in with them month after month. And for whatever reason, they couldn't quite capture it or they just didn't want to do it because of the finality of it. Uh, it, it just kept drifting. And, um, 
one thing that one writer mentioned to me uh, was he said at some point there was some traction for um, a jump in time, like a 10 year jump in time. Um, and everyone's still alive and they're together and the kids have grown up and maybe they have families and the twins would be around 10 or so. Um, but that got dismissed because it wasn't really the form of the show. Um, they didn't really do that before. So why do it at the end, which is a very common mistake on finales. If you think about shows, um, in this case, they were using the Mary Tyler Moore show as a North star because it was, it stayed true to the spirit of the show. It was funny. It was heartwarming. It was about a group of people who loved each other and there was change involved. Um, Chris Lloyd, uh, when I was talking to him along the way, there were two things he was saying. He was, they were trying to figure out who was, they knew everyone was going, but they wanted to know who they were going to spotlight on. Was it going to be Mitch and Cam with this idea of what they would joke in the writer's room as modern family, um, <laughs> of them going back to Missouri, to Kansas, I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was like one way to go. They talked about maybe building up Ariel, um, her going, which she does end up going away, but maybe the spotlight would be on that, or maybe the spotlight would be on Manny leaving on his one-year journey with his dad. So they knew that part. Uh, They just couldn't necessarily land on one in particular. Mitch and Cam was probably the first thing they landed on, but then they had to wrap it up uh, with everybody. Um, And interestingly enough for that, Chris Lloyd said, at one point uh, in the final days when I was talking to him, the opening of the last episode, everybody's hugging and saying go- goodbye. And then it's a false goodbye because there's issues with getting on the plane yeah. and so on. But that idea of beginning the finale with a goodbye as opposed to ending it, um, that was a last minute thing that somebody came up with as an idea and it gained a lot of traction. Um, so, you, you know, you never know along the way uh, what they'll come they'll come in with. Uh, you know, another popular idea, which is going to sound incredibly boring, was to make <laughs> the finale a non-finale. Just make it another day. Mm-hmm. This is a family. We followed them for 11 years, and at the end of the day, they they all go to bed, and and you know that's it. That would stay true to the show. It, it didn't have to be a special event, which is something that both showrunners didn't want. A special event is a special event. It's not your series. And that's a really common mistake that TV shows make. Uh, And you can understand why, because there's so much intense pressure to deliver on that. But um, another thing Chris mentioned, which was really important to him, was that you're trying to also say thank you to the fans. And, you know, they've given the show, they've cared, so you want to deliver for them and you feel that pressure on them and you want them to feel happy uh, with where these characters are left when, when the final frame shows, he kind of felt we owe them that. And, and that's a serious responsibility. And, and so that I think also was a big underplaying uh, theme undertow uh, throughout the final year was it's not just for us and it's not a special event. It's for the fans and to honor the show for everyone on the show and everyone watching the show. I have to say they did a great job and I would have been really upset as a super fan of the show to have seen that just be a normal day. The way they did it by starting with a goodbye, I thought was exceptional because we get that emotional part of the episode over with, and then we carried on with other, you know, situations and it was the show that we've always been watching, which was really excellent. Also, I'd say to that, uh, what was funny was uh, they kept having false leavings. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you have the comedy rule of three, which is, you know, you fail once, you fail twice, you fail the third time. If you fail the fourth time, it feels like too much. If you fail just twice, it feels like too little. So it's the Goldilocks scenario of comedy. Um, each one can be emotional, and they, there is a payoff, but you need the rule of three. And, and so once they started, decided on starting the end last episode with the end in a sense they had to play it out thematically with the rule of three i read on yahoo news which is a interesting place to find some celebrity gossip but jason alexander (laughs) was featured in an article about how he was bribed to reveal the secrets about the seinfeld finale 
and that the set was locked down and it was very secret and, and it was taken very seriously. How secret was this modern family finale? Going into it, there were definitely things, as I said, talking to the writers throughout, I knew a lot of things and I wasn't telling anyone except my wife um, about them. And so it was pretty secretive. They managed to, because the crew and cast were so close to each other, they managed to keep the secret internally. When I got to the set, I had been prepared to see. At first, Chris said, well, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be on set, and we've talked to the cast, and we really want to limit the number of publications that are going to be here. So when I got on set, I think the first day, there was a reporter who I later figured out was from USA Today. And then after that, I discovered uh, I was the only one, <laughs> I was the only one who was invited to hang out and be there. And they had already known me and accepted me. So in a sense, I, I was a guest star of the crew. <laughs> so it, it was completely locked down. Um, family and friends came on set. Um, I saw Ed's kids. Um, Rico's mother um, and sister, they were constantly on set um, throughout the entire history of the show, and they popped in. Um, uh, I'm trying to think who else. But anyway, the point being that those were the only people coming in. Even the network, ABC, uh, Disney, which owns ABC, they weren't coming in. Uh, the only other person of note uh, would be the um, unit unit photographer, he was taking pictures with his professional cool digital camera, and I had my iPhone. Um, <laughs> I had made a decision ahead of time that I didn't want to get in their way. Mm -hmm. I'm always trying not to get in the way. So I didn't bring my digital camera with me purposefully, but then I started seeing things that I wanted to capture. So I started taking pictures, um, and they actually were going to allow... The, most of the photos in the book are taken from a friend of mine, um, Mike Larson. He's a great celebrity photographer. And he was supposed to come down for one of the days I was there, uh, but ended up with a family emergency. So he would have been the second person on <laughs> there. And they knew him, too, because he had taken pictures from um, the previous times on set. So it really was a closed set. And... One of the things, I don't know if this show did it, I never asked, was um, they used to do things where they would have like uh, water labels wa um, or certain ways that scripts are marked with colors or yes. some mm -hmm. encryption so that if anything leaked out, they could trace it back to the person. Um, and chances are with a show like this and even Seinfeld because it was on so many years, everybody knows each other. And if, if word leaked out, everyone could figure out who did it culprit yep. you know but that didn't happen i mean i didn't hear that anything did not about happen it, so that's good i and i i guess if it happened it would have been on me too right <laughs> that would have been, <laughs> been even worse well or your wife so, uh, or your wife or my wife that's true yeah. it's right i'd i'd give her up you know i'd, <laughs> I'd save the career i'd give her no <laughs> Okay, as Nick mentioned, I have actually never seen an episode of Modern Family, but the book was so well written and so well put together that I could picture every detail from the first table read um, to the final show. I mean, it was, it was very well written. It seems like no detail was left out, no question unanswered, and it takes you from the start to the very end. So as a non-fan, it was a, a very delightful book to read and very informative. But I understand that there was lots and lots of memories that you shared, and there were lots of funny stories I found of, of different things. But tell me about one of your final memories, uh, like operating the clapboard for one of the final scenes that you witnessed. Um, there's one thing I want to say, which uh, before I jump into that, which is I'm, I'm very happy that you as a non-fan like the book. Um, obviously I'm happy if anyone likes the book, but one of the reasons in particular was I didn't, I wanted the book to be for the fans, but I wanted it to be accessible for people who didn't know the show. And I've heard to date from people in your boat, uh, the same thing that they either want to watch the show or they're interested in the show now and they weren't before. And that just kind of warms my heart because that really was a secondary attempt on, on my part to show television production if take it one level up if you weren't going to be into modern family 
watch how a show is created and lasts for 11 years. It's a fascinating thing to witness and see or read about. So having said that, the, uh, the, the, the clapboard, uh, it was completely spontaneous. Um, what happened was I had a flight out at 7, and I was driving from the west side in L.A. over to Burbank, and there's only about four ways to get from the west side over the mountains into the valley, and traffic is bad. You're always thinking to yourself, how many hours How many hours is it going to take me to get there, and then how many hours is it going to take me, should I be at the airport? Um, Burbank is an amazing airport, by the way. You never end up waiting at that airport. It almost feels like a, a five and dime airport, but it's a great airport. So I was doing the math in my head and I realized, okay, I'll leave around four. So somewhere around three, I started saying goodbye to people, um, as they'd walk by or they'd sit down next to me and I'd say, Hey, I just really you know, want to thank you again for letting me into the family and so on. And they were saying, oh, you got to come back. You got to come back at the end. And I said, you know, I'll try. And, and then this one guy, Sean, he was walking by and he handles the clapboard and he looked at me and he said, see you tomorrow, Mark. And I said, actually, you won't. <laughs> and, and he, he said, why? And I said, I'm, I'm leaving. And he said, oh, you're leaving. Hold on a sec. And so then, of course, I'm, I'm afraid because <laughs> I don't know what he's going to do. And there was a scene, it was the last Christmas episode, and the entire cast was around the table. This is what they were filming with the camera set up. And, and he said, I want you to do the clapboard. And I, was, I said, really? And, and he said, yeah, yeah, come do the clapboard. And, and so he said, you can do clapboard A. So there's A and B, and, and A is the more important one. And he probably saw the look on my face of fear. Somehow I would ruin the clapboard. Somehow I'd kill the scene, ruin the show. And he's like, why don't we do clapboard B? <laughs> so <laughs> they, gave me, uh, they gave me clapboard B. Um, and uh, I, the beauty of it was I could focus on the clapboard um, and not have to look at everybody because I knew after the clapboard, I was literally walking out the door. Mm. And also I hadn't gotten to say goodbye to everyone in the cast. So I had the clapboard. Um, I did it. And then everybody gave me a round of applause and I knew I'll just start crying if I look at anybody. So I was like, yeah, bye. You know, the, the hand wave and see you in Cleveland and I'm, I'm gone, uh, <laughs> which was the best and easiest way for me uh, to get out of there. But it was so indicative of things that the cast and crew would do um, uh, when they would have guest stars or when they would have um, people in the background who would be on multiple episodes that last week, uh, what I would witness is they'd say, Oh, this is, and there's this one person I'm thinking of Charlie trainer. They'd say, this is Charlie's last scene. And when he finished, everyone around would give him an, an applause. So it was just something sweet that they would do for people's lasts. I didn't mm. expect it for my last, but uh, it is something as a memory. It's a, it's a great memory uh, that I well carry with me. Um, I, uh, in these oral histories in general, uh, I've made friends with people I never, you know, I worshiped as kids on shows that I watched endlessly live run, first run and in syndication. And to think that you're then talking to these people or you're breaking bread with them or so on. Um, it's, it was beyond what I could hope for, and this memory definitely falls in that category. That's really cool. Your book is available everywhere on Tuesday, which we're really excited to have it come out. I've pre-ordered my copy already, so uh, although I've been able to read it, my, uh, what did you call it, where it's watermarked, <laughs> now I'll actually get the <laughs> physical copy and I can see the pictures. I'm excited about that. But where do you recommend people to go get the copy of the book? Well, you know, uh, a lot of people go to Amazon where you can get, there's the Kindle version, the hardcover version, there's the audio version, which I read on in parts, which was a lot of fun, but I'll never listen to it because <laughs> I can't listen to my own voice. <laughs> um, you could go to any place they sell books like Target, Barnes & Noble. Um, you can find it just about anywhere um, through Google. I would also say that anything you can do to support local businesses, such as local bookstores, would go a long way. Um, I think that would be a great thing and they'll be ca carrying it or you can ask if they're carrying it um, to get your copy. It, it, it reminds me 
um, Howard Stern after 9-11. On his show, he would give phone numbers and free plugs to businesses around Ground Zero who were going to potentially lose their business but were staying open. And, you know, anything anybody can do to support people in the tough economy we currently have, I think, is a great thing. So um, I'm honored and privileged if people want to buy the book. Uh, but I'd say, you know, if you can do local, that would be a wonderful contribution to the local economy. And um, But ultimately, you can get it anywhere they sell books. Awesome. Well, Mark Freeman is the author of The Untold oral history of one of television's groundbreaking sitcoms. It's Modern Family, and it's available on Tuesday. So go on out and get the book. Mark, thanks so much for being here. It was a wonderful hour full of stories, and I greatly appreciate all the insight that you gave us into one of my favorite shows. Well, thank you for having me. And as you can tell, I can babble about the show all day long. (laughs) So uh, thank you for giving me the venue to babble. We loved it. Our thanks to Mark Freeman for joining us this week, sharing all of his stories about Modern Family and more of them can be found in his book, which is available on Tuesday. You can go on and pre-order it now and they'll probably ship it to you in time to get it on Tuesday. Yeah, that was a really fascinating um, interview. And thanks. Like I said, I had not really ever seen the show. And so I got a great perspective to be able to understand the show kind of like from beginning to end. Yeah, well, I was a little shocked that you had never seen the show, but I mean, we can't watch There's everything. There's lots of shows I've never seen. Exactly, exactly. All right, um, so thanks for bringing your dog into the, the trailer with you so that yeah, he could I'm interrupt sorry, the Yeah, I'm sorry, people, thing. for the dog barking. Goodness gracious. We taped a show last week, and I think the dog was barking too, and I couldn't figure out if it was your dog or the guest's dog, but... Probably mine. It was probably yours. Mm. Well, you're going to hear that show in a couple weeks. So uh, anyway, now you'll know. We are all over social media. We are at Fan Counters on Facebook. Sharpie Nation is the name of our private Facebook group. And you can always email us if you want. At hello at fancounters.com. And until next week when we have another celebrity guest, this time from one of the most awesome horror series of all time. It's going to be an epic podcast next week i may pass on that one come on you know how much i love scary movies Mm, she's a wuss we'll see all right well we'll see if you're here next week there's only one way to (laughs) to find that out come back all right people we appreciate you and we hope you're having a quarantine to remember (laughs) we'll see you next week bye Bye bye-bye